goes from the eyeball through the thalamus to the visual cortex of the brain. Now you need the visual cortex for consciously seeing something. The other pathway, which is older evolutionarily, and is more prominent in animals like rodents, lower mammals, birds, and reptiles, goes to the brain stem, the stalk on which the brain sits. And from the brain stem gets relayed eventually to the higher centers of the brain. Specifically, the older pathway going through the brain stem is concerned with reflexive behavior orienting to something important in the visual field, making eye movements, directing your gaze, directing your head towards something important. In these patients, one of these pathways alone is damaged, the visual cortex is damaged. And because that's gone, the patient doesn't see anything consciously. But the other pathway is still intact. And he can use that pathway to guess correctly the direction of movement of an object that he cannot see. Graham's vision is similar to that of reptiles, who depend on unconscious blindsight for their survival. A lizard, if it wants to catch a fly, it doesn't actually have to see a fly, it doesn't have to recognize a fly, it just has to be aware of something moving. So, I suppose me and the lizard are distant cousins. One of the goals of neuroscience is to understand which parts of the brain are dedicated to what function how different mental capacities map on to different pathways and different neural circuits in the brain. And surely this fascinating syndrome is going to help us understand not only the nature of seeing, not only the division of labor between these different pathways, but the question of what is consciousness? What does it mean to be consciously aware of something? Why is one pathway alone conscious, but as the other pathway behaves like a zombie that's trapped inside him, that's unconscious, the syndrome is so strange that when it was initially reported, people didn't believe it, and there are some people who still don't believe it. But it's, in a sense, it's not that strange if you think about it, because in a sense, we experience blindsight all the time in our daily lives. For example, as I am driving this car, uh, having this conversation, all my attention is on the conversation, on the person next to me. And in fact, I'm not conscious of what's going on around me. Even though I'm negotiating all this traffic, avoiding obstacles, avoiding that car on my right, avoiding the car on my left, that's all being done in parallel by another part of my brain, and it never emerges into conscious awareness, unless something very strange happens, like a big truck passes by, I might notice it. Blind sight enables us to steer our way successfully through the world, as if on autopilot. Now, how are we on the right side? Oops. Without this zombie in our brains, we'd be swamped by visual information, unable to focus on what really matters. Unlike Graham, Peggy Palmer has normal vision. She should be able to copy this star easily. I'll never get this star, I'm hopeless at this. But something odd is happening. One whole side of the star is missing. Peggy has a condition called visual neglect. Although her eyesight is fine, half of her visual world no longer seems to matter. Ten years ago, Peggy suffered a stroke in the parietal lobes of her brain. The parietal lobes are concerned mainly with creating a three-dimensional representation of the spatial layout of the world, allowing a person to walk around, to navigate, to avoid bumping into things. When the right parietal is damaged, the patient is unable to deal with the left side of the world. This condition has fascinated neurologists for more than a century because it reveals not only how the brain shapes the way we perceive space in the present, it even determines the spatial look of our memories. This became apparent when Peggy was asked to draw a daisy from memory. Right. A daisy it shall be. For neuropsychologist Peter Halligan, Peggy's drawings reveal exactly what's gone wrong. It's like a radar system, whereby the actual radar system on the left-hand side is no longer working well. 
If someone comes in on my left-hand side now, or I hear a sound, my eyes will immediately move to the left-hand side. That makes me, for evolutionary purposes, very aware of my environment. Because if I wasn't aware of those things, I'd have accidents. I get hurt, or I might get eaten by wild animals and whatever. Now, in Peggy's case, she will not attend to those things that we would normally be aware of. Peggy thinks she's drawn her daisies right, until it's pointed out to her. You've noticed that, have you? Oh, dear. So what Peggy's drawn for us is several nice daisies with the left side missing. The same with this one and this one. And look at this one. This is a very good example. I've done it on all of them. <laughs> Which means that she's not only neglecting events in the world, but when she conjures up a mental image, she's ignoring the left side of that mental image. Well, I thought I was going all the way around, you see. And this shows you that this is not simply a sensory problem, but mm. a problem of consciousness. I don't know. It's because I was so concentrating on that side, it takes everything away, you see. It's this attention, really. It's taken, it's taken away. This, there must be two attentions somewhere in your body that one side's taking the other one away. I can't make it out at all. Very odd. Peggy's one-sided daisies graphically reveal how damage to the visual centers can warp our consciousness of the world and how complex the human visual system actually is. When I was a medical student, I was taught there's an area in the back of the brain called visual cortex, and that's where seeing takes place. But since then, we have learned, in fact, there's not just one, there are 30 areas in the brain concerned just with seeing. For Ramachandran, a walk through this Southern California mall shows exactly what these visual areas have evolved for. And maybe these different areas are specialized for different aspects of vision. One area for seeing colors, another area for seeing movement, or form and shape, relative distance and depth. Now, despite this staggering complexity of all these different areas, there seems to be a simple overall pattern of organization. In fact, the visual input as it comes in seems to divide into two parallel streams of processing. There is one pathway which we call the how pathway to which some of these areas belong and that how pathway seems to be concerned mainly with navigation, with being able to walk around, avoid bumping into obstacles, be avoiding uneven terrain, reaching out and grabbing something. The how pathway leads from the main visual areas to the parietal lobes at the top of the brain, where Peggy suffered her stroke. The other pathway, the what pathway, leads from the main visual areas to the temporal lobes, located just behind our temples. The what pathway is concerned with recognizing the object. What am I looking at? What does it mean for me? Is this an edible object? Is it a flower? Is it a person's face? What is it that I'm looking at? And what does it mean for me? That's what the what pathway is concerned with. And it's that pathway that seems to be damaged in David. David presented Ramachandran with one of the strangest cases he has ever encountered. Two years ago, David was involved in a terrible car accident while driving back to California from Mexico. There was a problem with the car, and I landed in the highway with my head first. Okay, right. Like this truck that is coming by? For five weeks, David lay in a coma. Serious injuries led to the loss of his right arm. But to everyone's relief, when he regained consciousness, his mental capacities seemed to be intact. He was articulate, he was intelligent, not obviously psychotic or emotionally disturbed. Uh, he could read a newspaper, everything seemed fine, except he had one profound delusion. He would look at his mother and he would say, this woman, doctor, she looks exactly like my mother. 